fourth quadratium of the of the semester. So Protika uh, she did the BSc and MSc from Agri University and then went to CI Park, the energy physics group for his uh, uh, doctorate degree. And there he worked on uh, essentially building uh, various parts and components of uh, a high energy gamma ray um, detector and telescope in fast money. So we are just discussing that he spent a lot of time during his PhD days uh, at fast money. And then after his PhD, uh, so he became an expert on all these uh, TV detection. So very high energy gamma ray detections. Uh, and then he, uh, at first he was, so there are, uh, let's say two very big uh, TV astronomy facility in the world. One is uh, uh, owned by European uh, institutions and it's, in, it's called MAGIC. It's the telescope is located in the Canary Islands. And then there is another, which is uh, mostly used by uh, American astronomers, and it's in Arizona, it's called Verita. So, Pratikda was at first a postdoc at NAGI. Uh, then, uh, he spent some time with, uh, at NEU in uh, characterizing the Fermi gamma ray telescope, uh, some instruments of that. And then he was uh, a postdoc at JC. So at JC, he actually worked on some multi-messenger uh, astronomy where, uh, which mostly of which he will talk about today. And then after JC, he was also a, uh, so what is the other, uh, what is the other, other than magic, what is the other name that I said about very good uh, TV facility? Very good. Very good, that's right. So, so he was a postdoc, so it's an it's a interactive introduction. <laughs> so he was a, he was a postdoc at Veritas as well. Uh, he was, uh, so Veritas also has a presidency, alumna, uh, Professor Rekhi Mojinda, who has, sorry, Rekhi uh, So I'm just, I'm on Mojinda. <laughs> so, so he also did talk at Veritas. Anyway, so after Veritas, Pratikta came back to India and became a faculty member at the uh, Science Institute of Nuclear Physics, where uh, he has been ever since. And uh, so, as I said, that Pratikta is one of the few uh, experts on TV astronomy and particularly TV instruments. If you talk to senior astronomers and administrators in India, they will always say that they are, uh, India really needs instrumentalists who will work on astronomy instruments. So Pratikta is one of the elusive uh, you know, people in India who can actually uh, work with, uh, with their hands, not just computers, but actual things, actual instruments. Um, and he's also, uh, uh, I, I cannot uh, say the exact name of the position, but he holds a uh, position in the, in the magic group which is a sort of a worldwide collaboration for TV astronomy and other follow-up uh, multi uh, initiatives. So I think uh, papers that are written by the magic collaboration, at some stage it has to go through uh, Pratikta. So you have to, <laughs> so if you are writing TV astronomy papers anywhere in the world, uh, Pratikta is probably see your paper at some point or we see. So with that, uh, uh, let's not delay. And so that today we talk uh, about not just TV astronomy, but uh, multi-messenger astronomy, because that's what we need now to understand our universe. First, uh, thank you, Rito Van, for an overly kind introduction. <laughs> I don't think I deserve that kind introduction. <laughs> it's really very nice of you to yes. do that. Yes. And uh, it's always a pleasure and honor to come and give a talk at uh, presidency. Yeah. I, uh, several years ago, when we, I had just joined Shaha Institute, and Ritovan and Shuchetona had also joined presidency, I had come here. I don't know. Uh, huh. I, I had joined here. I came and gave a colloquium also at that time, several years ago. And I'm, exactly, in the, in the other auditorium. Yeah. So, oh, so it's... Uh, it's really an honor to be here and uh, give uh, talks and colloquium to you. Okay, so uh, today the topic I'm going to, and uh, also to tell you, 
for the last several years, I have not been doing any instrumentation. I have switched almost from instrumentation to data analysis and simulations these days. So simply because, you know, to do instrumentation in India, it's such a ter terrible job sometimes I feel uh, with the purchases and bureaucracies and everything. I enjoyed it when I was a student because I didn't have to take care of all those things. My boss took care of those. <laughs> so I enjoyed that. But today I don't enjoy anymore when I see that 90% of my time I have to spend in separate thing and only 10% of the time I can spend in the lab. So I have a small lab. So you are always very welcome to come and visit the lab. I have some small experiments for post MSc students who can do that there. Not really research lab kind of research lab. I have dreams that I can make one, but I don't know whether I can do it or not. But anyway, that's not the topic of today. Uh, today's topic would be on multi-messenger astrophysics with high energy neutrinos and photons. And uh, so, or this one, yeah. this one would work or page down. Yeah. Ah, can change from this one? Yeah, I think this one. Ah, this one. Oh, okay. It got stuck. Yeah, it should work. Now it ah, should okay. work. Eight, 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 eight. Eight. <laughs> so, so, you know that 2017 is a year when a lot of interesting thing happens in astrophysics. Especially, I call it a year of the multi-messenger events. Simply because in 2017, the most important discovery happened was the multi-messenger de uh, detection of a, the electromagnetic com component of a gravitational wave uh, uh, signature of mergers of two binary stars, right? But at the same time, so that created an explosion of papers, an explosion of, and, uh, of interest among the community, the astrophysics community, because almost for 50 years, people have been trying to detect gravitational waves and its electromagnetic component, right? At the same time, I kind of call it a slightly minor one, but still quite interesting. And I, I'll tell you why it is so interesting. Got overshadowed, I'd say, got overshadowed by the big event of gravitational waves and its electromagnetic counterpart was that on uh, in September 22nd, Fermilat, and we'll talk about what Fermilat is about and also what magic is about in the next slides, but just to introduce you to the topic, that Fermilat said that it showed, saw a detection of an increased gamma ray activity from a blazer, which is TXS0506, a blazer in the sky, from the Texas X-ray survey, it came the name, it got the name. And, uh, and it, it also said located inside the ice cube error region. And, at, and a few days later, around the 4th of October, Magic reported an ETL saying that the first time detection of VHG gamma rays by the telescope from a direction consistent with the recent EHE. EHE is the name EHE derives from extremely high energy, extremely high energy neutrino event, which was detected by Ice Cube around 22nd of September. So it, the name came from 1709, just like in GRBs, you give the name from the date on which you locate them. So Ice Cube also decided to give the name like that, 170922. So that was the first uh, thing which. So that, let me just tell you then that <clears throat> what does multi-messenger astrophysics really mean or look for? So it looks for basically the very age old problem and we'll also talk, discuss a little bit of that problem is the origin of cosmic rays. So a hundred years have passed after the discovery of our cosmic rays by Victor Hess and we have still do not have enough clues or we do not, we have some directions and some clues but not enough signatures that which are the sources of cosmic rays. Some theories, theoretical studies say that active galactic nuclei are one of the most plausible sources of cosmic rays. <clears throat> and that links up with three different things. And we will talk about that in this talk. It's called beta electron volt neutrino astronomy. And we will say why we have to go to such high energies. Then it is linked with gamma ray astronomy and also somewhat linked with lower at lower uh, energies in optical and X-rays. And these are some of the telescopes and detectors which participated in this observation, which I would talk about today. We will also talk about what is the connection between cosmic rays, neutrinos, and gamma rays. That's a very, very important thing which we, one has to appreciate in this. So let's begin with a little bit of a historical context is the cosmic ray spectrum. So, <clears throat> 
If you look at what I have drawn here, the x-axis is the energy and the y-axis is the flux of cosmic rays that you see. So you see that it goes over for almost a large energy uh, range from about 1 GeV, 10 to the power of 9 electron volt, all the way up to 10 to the power of 21 electron volts. And it is basically almost a pure uh, power law falling spectrum. However, there are differences. And I, I'll just briefly mention because as a side topic of this talk, and in 1912, Victor Hess performed a life-threatening experiment in order to discover them. I don't know if you are aware of how he went, uh, went up that without even a breathing apparatus, he took a couple of engineers with him and flew up in a balloon in order to measure whether there were charged particles coming from outer space. And in those days, remember 1910, what did we know about uh, all the radiation that was coming to us? We all knew was radioactivity was well known to us. We knew X-rays has been discovered by Ranjan, right? So everything that people thought would come were coming from Earth, around the Earth. So the expectation was that if you go away in a balloon or whatever in, an, in a uh, device up above the Earth's atmosphere, the radiation should slowly decrease. That's that's what you would want to uh, you would expect to find. So Victor Hess wanted to test that. Before Victor Hess, a few people had done that. Some people took a detector up into the Eiffel Tower, top of the Eiffel Tower, and placed it there. And then some people took it up to um, in the region of Mont Blanc in the, in the Alps and placed a detector there. But it was still not high enough, so they could not really detect with their small detectors any particles or radiation coming from outer space. So Victor Hess was the first when he went, so he when he went up in the balloon. What he found was that indeed radiation decreases. So radioactivity and all these things are decreasing, it decreases. But after a while at around, I, as far as I remember 2.5 kilometers or so, the radiation again started increasing. And that's, thus he said that something is coming from outer space and that's why the name cosmic rays was given to it. <clears throat> there was a very strong debate between Millikan and Compton, whether these are gamma rays because Millikan proposed that these are gamma rays and Compton said that these are charged particles. Do you know how this debate was settled? Could you kind of imagine how this debate was settled between whether it will be gamma rays or charged particles? It's basically the magnetic field is different at the equator and at the poles. So if I go and measure the flux at these different places, I would know whether these are gamma rays or charged particles. And that's how people, after Victor Hess did this experiment, people started doing these measurements and then the debate was settled in favor of Compton. And we now know that cosmic rays are basically charged particles. Okay, Victor has won the Nobel Prize in 1936. So now even open questions, even after let's say 100 years. So what I have done here is that I have plotted the same spectrum by multiplying the flux by e to the power of 2.5, right? You, you see here that I have done is e to the power of 2.5 multiplied by the flux, right? So now if, the power law would be just 2.5, I would just see a flat line parallel to the x-axis. Then we start to see the features in the spectrum. It was not really any more parallel. We saw that it was still a falling power law with some deviations. So the spectrum started to steepen at around 10 to the power of 15 electron volts. Then at around 10 to the power of 18 to 19 electron volts, the spectrum again started to flatten out. So it exactly happens like the leg of a person. That's why the name came, the name came was that this is the knee of the spectrum. And then the physicists gave the name that this is the ankle of the spectrum. That's how the knee and the ankle came. And people in cosmic who do pure cosmic ray physics studies actually try to study what is the composition around the knee? What is the composition around the ankle? How does particles get accelerated up to the knee or the ankle? So these are kind of the questions that we want to answer as cosmic ray physicists. So then the burning questions, as I said, that where, what and where are these sources? How are they really accelerated? How do they really propagate uh, to us? And as I said, the, the knee and the ankle, these information, they carry information about the change in the composition and the origin of the cosmic rays. That are cosmic rays only galactic in nature? That's also another question that you have to ask. Are they only within our source, sources within our galaxy? Or there are sources which could be coming out, are there outside our galaxy or not? So all these things uh, started to move after the discoveries. And, but even after 100 years, after having done so many experiments, we are still not totally clear about what's going on there. Okay, 
Now let's look at a little bit of the theoretical part that how do cosmic rays get uh, accelerated. So one thing to remember is that highest energy cosmic ray, which is of the order of three times 10 to the power of 20 electron volts. Oh, there is one more thing I think I should mention for those who do particle physics, know a little bit of particle physics and keep track of particle physicists. Almost all the elementary particles from the 1920s to the 1940s, before the accelerators started to be built, were all discovered in cosmic rays. All the ones, the positrons, the kaons, the pions, everything was discovered in cosmic rays. And another point is that the Large Hadron Collider, which you all know, which is a man-made machine, huge machine, accelerating protons and colliding protons uh, at uh, TeV energies, stops somewhere around here. The center of mass energy would be something around few tens of TeV or so the center of mass energy. So it's an, also a very enigmatic question that what does nature do in order to accelerate particles so easily to 10 to the power of 20 electron volts or so, which we cannot do it in, in the laboratories really. So that's another very, very important thing to study. So, so that uh, theoretical work was initially was uh, kind of done by none other than the celebrated scientist, uh, uh, physicist Enrico Fermi, who in 1949 wrote a very seminal paper gave, giving the first ideas on the origin of cosmic radiation, where he said that the that what it says that a theory of cosmic radiation he proposed according to which cosmic rays are originated and accelerated pr uh, primarily in the interstellar space of the galaxy by collisions against moving magnetic fields. So that was his main idea that there are moving magnetic fields in the, in my uh, galaxy. And then if a charged particle comes and hits it, and when it comes out after various collisions from the other side of the uh, of this uh, big uh, mass, it would gain some energy. And he did show by uh, calculating the fractional change in energy as one is a particle from E1 and P1 gets in and then comes out with E2 and P2, he showed the fractional energy. But however, what he showed that the efficiency of this extraction, the energy that is coming out is of the order of beta square, where beta is V by C, basically. Now, since beta, which is the velocity at which these cloud or big clouds are moving, is very, very small, beta is much, much less than one, the incremental energy increase is very, very small. So you could accelerate particles, of course, but you cannot accelerate particles to very, very high energies. If I start with, with 10 GeV particles in a box, let's say this is my accelerator, this is my box, uh, or this is my cloud, okay, and a particle has entered, I have injected a particle of a certain energy E1, which is low energy, when it goes out of the box, it cannot increase too much. It doesn't have too much of energy. So it was difficult to confine them inside this and then accelerate and to very high energies. However, later on, people started to think about this uh, in a more serious way. Again, Fermi in 1954, he modified his uh, whole theory. And then he talked about what are called astrophysical shocks, which are ubiquitous in astrophysics. So what he said was that the particles, let's say electrons or any other hadrons, would get scattered many times in this shock front and then gain energy in each cycle. And by this, one could, since this shock could move with very high velocities, with this, you could accelerate particles to very, very high energies. And indeed, if you do the mathematical calculation, you would see that the final energy is now proportional to beta, where now this beta, the V, is close to the speed of light, right? Uh, uh, and so uh, you can accelerate particles to very high energies now, even if you start with a small, small number, small energy number. He also showed that the power that one could get a power law spectrum, not just he, uh, there were other peoples later on who talked about like Krimsky, Axford, and then others, Bell and Blanford and Ostriker in several, uh, uh, Fermi did not calculate the spectrum really. He only talked about the energies and that's all he, and, and only gave the idea of shock front. The later people basically did all these calculations and uh, then derived the power law spectrum. And now we know that the predicted power law spectrum, it predicts about e to the power of minus two spectrum in cosmic rays. So it comes close to what observations told us, because the observations had told us that the cosmic ray spectrum was somewhere around 2.6, 2.7. If you go back here, 
you would see that if I had multiplied it by 2.5, it's a little bit uh, steeper than 2.5. So it's about 2.7 or so. So it, uh, things came closer, however, still not up to the mark to 2.7, but then people started in introducing that these particles would diffuse, would have a diffusion. And so one has to take an energy dependent diffusion equation and then plug it inside in this diffusion. Uh, that is how the thing of shock acceleration mechanism became a diffusive shock acceleration mechanism because you have to introduce diffusion inside it. Once you make this an energy dependent and make the whole calculation very complex, one could go and arrive at, at uh, 2.5 to 2.7 spectrum kind of. But this is still again a matter of debate that whether the uh, energy dependent diffusion could be as high as 0.7 or not, or 0 0.5, 0 0.7 or not is a matter of debate and a matter of work which is still ongoing in cosmic ray physics. <clears throat> also the maximum energy and possible sites could now be calculated simply from Larmor confinement. And one could show then this was shown uh, as a, so if you have a magnetic field as a function of the size of the accelerator, one could show what could be the possible, plausible sites of acceleration where particles could be accelerated at high, to high energies. And from this maximum energy, one could calculate that gamma ray bursts, active galactic nuclei, or galaxy clusters seem to be the best candidates for very high energy cosmic ray studies. This was also done several years ago. <clears throat> One thing to note that these are primarily sources which are extragalactic in nature. Okay. So the galactic cosmic rays end up at a much smaller energy, at a lower energy, which is close to the knee of the spectrum. And the highest energy cosmic rays come from, if you look at this plot, the highest energy cosmic rays would come from most of the sources which are pre predominantly extragalactic in nature. Okay. Now, now came the question of, can I pinpoint it back to the source? Can I understand what is the source of cosmic ray? And here became the big, big came the biggest trouble because charged particles get deflected in the magnetic field. So if you have a, a, a let's say a source, whatever a supernova remnant or an active galaxy, whatever, which is giving out cosmic accelerating cosmic rays, they would get deflected in the magnetic field, and then by the time they reach you with your detector on the Earth, they have lost their apparent source direction. So the whole thing has been scrambled. Hence, you cannot go back to the source anymore. However, if these charged particles would emit, uh, would uh, by interacting around the matter in these uh, in these sources, would emit photons or neutrinos. Then, and these photons and neutrinos would come directly to you. And then you can, point, if you can detect photons and neutrinos from these sources, then you you can directly point back to the source. And then you can model, model the source and say that whether there were, what sort of charged particles were there. And this is the connection between cosmic rays, gamma rays, and neutrinos. So what happens if you know a little bit of part, if you have studied a little bit of particle physics, you would know that a proton, which are primarily the cosmic ray proton, could interact with the, nuclear, with the hydrogen or whatever is present around the, around the source and produce pions. And then there are three types of particles produced. One is the neutral pion, which would promptly decay into two photons. And it, could all, it would also produce charged pions, negatively and positively charged pions. And these pions would decay and would give you muons and neutrinos. And this is the birth of what, how neutrinos are generated in these cosmic sources. So what, I, what we say is that spatial and temporal correlations between neutrinos and gamma rays, if you study, can trace cosmic ray acceleration or interaction sites. And this is where our whole topic, today's topic is based on that. That we would look for sources of cosmic ray origin by looking at spatial and temporal correlations between neutrinos and gamma rays. Yeah. Okay. Now, what are the types of acceleration uh, mechanisms that you have when with these uh, uh, with these charged particles or uh, charged particles? We have two types of charged particles which can be present. The simplest, let's take, excluding the heavier nuclei, you have the protons and the electrons. So, what would the protons do? The protons will interact, as I just now said, with matter. They would produce this family of pions. The pi zeros would decay into two gammas the pions would decay into neutrinos. That's one. And this is what we call the acceleration mechanism is predominantly then we say is hadronic in nature. Whereas if there are electrons in my system, if the source is uh, giving out electrons, is accelerating electrons, 
then the electrons would, and if there is magnetic field in uh, around, the electrons would produce synchrotron uh, uh, radiation. These synchrotron radiations can be from all the way from radio to uh, X-ray energies. And then depending upon the energy of the uh, synchrotron photons and the energy of the electrons of the charged particles which are present in the system, they can interact among each other and then produce just the opposite of the Compton effect. And you all, most of you almost know here that it is the inverse Compton effect by which the low energy photons, the synchrotron, low energy synchrotron photons will be upscaled to the high energy TeV, GeV TeV photons. So that's another way of producing GeV TeV photons. Can you distinguish between the two spectra then? What would be the spectral energy distribution of the spectra if you plot, can you do? It turns out that you can somewhat do because this pion in the rest, the rest frame would decay into two photons and the ma rest mass of the pion is about 130 MeV. So you would get 60, at the rest frame, you would get 65 MeV as the two photons. And then if they have higher and higher energies, then you would get higher and higher energy. So, but it's equally shared. So what you can understand that the spectrum would be somewhat flatter like this. At, at the peak position, it would be flat and then it would just drop down. It would start, uh, have a peak position, a flatter position and then uh, drop down. Whereas the inverse Compton effect, if you really work out the mathematics, it's uh, you can look at Jackson's book or some other books of long air and high energy astrophysics. And if you work it out, you would see that it would follow kind of the synchrotron spectrum, which rises steeply, has a maximum, then falls off again very quite steeply. So in principle, by looking at the two spectra, you should be able to distinguish between the two emission mechanisms. If I can have data all over. So now comes the region where you need data from almost all the telescopes around. So this is the time when people started understanding that not just multi wavelength, not just locating a source in one wavelength is not enough. You need wave information from almost all the wavelengths around you in order to make head or tail of the sources. So I just thought like, like if you have X-rays, you can put, uh, you can probe this part of the spectrum. If you have uh, gamma rays like Fermi, you can uh, probe the rising part of the spectrum and then this peak and the falling part of the spectrum, you can probe with TeV instruments. However, one thing <clears throat> became also uh, certain in the last years is that it's not enough to distinguish between these two uh, acceleration mechanisms by looking at only the electromagnetic spectrum. Because what happens is that, let's say these uh, pions, which are also produced by matter proton-proton uh, interaction, these pions also produce uh, synchrotron and inverse Compton. And then they start to mimic to part partly this IC spectrum also. So which, what, which is something which we call the pure leptonic accelerator can also come from pions. So if I want to say a hadronic accelerator, then there are pi plus and pi minus associated along with the pi zeros. And they start to modify all the spectrum and they become extremely complicated. So it becomes very difficult just from the electromagnetic part of the spectrum to distinguish between the model, the different acceleration mechanisms. And this is where the neutrinos enter into the game. Because if you detect neutrinos from the source, you know that definitely neutrinos cannot come from the decay of neutral pions. They would have come from proton-proton proton, proton interacting and there are pions pi plus and pi minus. So the leptonic acceleration mechanism can be ruled out if I can definitely detect neutrinos from those sources. Even though it's very still quite difficult and very model dependent, but it becomes kind of the smoking gun to say that the hadronic acceleration really exists in these kind of sources. Okay. So just to show you what are the types of interactions that can happen in different in a slightly different way. Another point is that photons and neutrinos among them, the universe is open. You know, all know, many of you know that the universe is opaque to multi TeV photons from distant extragalactic sources. Because of the low energy background light that is present, uh, <clears throat> from extragalactic background light that is present, which interact with the high energy photons, and then the pair produced to E plus and E minus, there is a gamma ray horizon that up to which I can see gamma rays coming from a source. However, the neutrinos being weakly interacting particles do not suffer from such problems. Hence, neutrinos also become, again, the uh, almost the ultimate messenger, of, according to some people, neutrinos become the ultimate messengers from the highest energy accelerators. 
at cosmic distance scales. Just uh, to also let you know that uh, if you do all these calculations, you will see that a pion on an average takes about one fifth of the proton's energy. And each neutrino takes about one fourth of the pion energy. So if you can measure the neutrino energy, which would be about one twentieth of the maximum proton energy. So from the neutrino, measuring the neutrino energy, you can measure what would be the energy, uh, uh, typical energy of the proton that is getting accelerated there. So that's another important thing that uh, one can note from here. You know, most of you also now know by now that what are the sources of cosmic rays or high energy gamma rays. There are uh, galactic sources like supernova remnants, pulsar V nebula. There are bi binary systems, microquasars and other kinds of objects. There are pulsars. And then gamma rays have also been observed from the center of our galaxy. And then there are also <clears throat> extra galactic ob objects in gamma rays, the most important of them are which are called blazars, which are a subclass of active galactic nuclei, which are highly variable and can accelerate particles. As we say that from theoretical considerations, we know that they can accelerate particles to very, very high energies. Yeah, and again, I have plotted the SED here, so not much to say here. Let's now come to a bit to the detectors that we will use now to detect high energy neutrinos and gamma rays. One of the most important ones is the ice cube detector the ice cube neutrino telescope at South Pole. So <clears throat> all what they do is that they dig. Now, why do you need to go to South Pole? Simple reason is the neutrinos are weakly interacting particles. So you need a huge volume that you need in order to have one or few interactions in that whole huge volume in order to produce some meaningful signal. Two ways you can get that. One is going to ice, one is going to water. People have gone to water. So in the Mediterranean Sea, what people do in the sea, they put strings and uh, the detectors into the sea, at, up to the seabed, and thereby, and a neutrino comes and interacts in the water, and then it produces a muon, and this muon can be detected by, I'll show the pictures, a muon can be detected with these uh, optical modules that you have, the photo, basically the photomultiplier tubes. <clears throat> Here, what happens is the same thing is the ice. You neutrino comes and interacts uh, with the ice. And uh, there are these strings which are dug in the ice, made holes in the ice, and then you put detectors inside. And then along with these, in all these strings, you at various spaces, you put a cluster of photomultipliers. Why you put cluster of photomultipliers will be uh, clear in the next slide. <clears throat> so just to uh, complete the whole story that on top of this, they also have a cosmic ray air shower array called ice top for which they want to study cosmic rays, basically the composition of cosmic rays at very, very high, uh, very, very high energies. Okay, so what happens here? So a cosmic neutrino, okay, a cosmic neutrino comes and interacts in the ice and produces a nuclear reaction. What it produces is basically a muon. A muon is again a weakly interacting particle. So it can move a long distance inside the ice. And here you see at various spaces, you have what they call digital optical modules, but these are just clusters of photomultipliers. Now you know that if a charged particle moves in a medium with a velocity greater than the velocity of light in that medium, it emits Cherenkov light. This is exactly what happens here also. The muon travels with a speed which is greater than the speed of light in that medium that's in, in the ice, and it produces a Cherenkov light. Cherenkov light is coherent in nature, and this Cherenkov, so it can be mapped by all these photomultipliers which, which are there. And <clears throat> these optical sensors or photomultiplier tubes catch, uh, catch the light. Why, from an experimental point of view, let me just, since I'm an experimentalist, so I try to uh, give you a little bit of flavor of experiments in the things. Why do you use photomultipliers? Why don't you use CCDs here? You could have used CCDs, one could have tried. The reason is that this Cherenkov light, the pulse of the Cherenkov, the rise time and the fall time of the pulse of this Cherenkov light is of the order of a few nanoseconds. It's two nanoseconds, two to three nanoseconds rise time and three to four nanoseconds fall time. So it's so sharp that you cannot, that's the reason why you cannot see Cherenkov light with your naked eye. You need to have special devices in order to map that to see Cherenkov light. Photomultiplier tubes are exactly the same, these objects or these instruments which have response time of, of the order of nanoseconds. That's why, whereas CCDs are much, much slow, res have slow response. That's why with CCDs, you can do optical light studies, 
which are much slower in nature. However, with CCDs, you cannot do, we will not be able to map high energy muons, uh, the Cherenkov light coming from these high energy muons. Okay. <clears throat> Next, the other one, I will go very fast on this because almost all of you here know about the Fermilat Observatory. It's, uh, it, it is a detector in space, which has three main components. It's basically a tracker to determine the trajectory. What the tra how does it make get the uh, information, the direction information? Because the Fermilab telescope is not a pointed instrument. Most telescopes are pointed instruments, right? But this is a detector. This is a detector, also a telescope, because it is moving in space, but it has a field of view which is very, very large. It's almost covering almost, almost the entire uh, a huge field of view of 2.4 steradians. So then how would you know something has come from this direction or that direction? That's because let's say you have a photon coming and hitting, there are what they call conversion foils or silicon wafers inside. There are uh, stacks of silicon wafers. And this is what I was doing in uh, Italy at some point of time, measuring the performance of these silicon wafers many years ago. So <clears throat> you inter the photon interacts in this uh, silicon wafer converts itself into E plus E minus. And at each stage, it keeps a uh, track. It leaves a mark in these foils. And then at the end, there is a calorimeter where it dumps all its energy. A calorimeter is a place where it dumps all its energy by producing an electromagnetic shower. So then if I have a reconstruction algorithm to find out the positions of where the hits came for each of these tracks, each of these foils, then I can very well easily reconstruct back the direction in which it came from. And now you also know those who do Fermi analysis, why now you will be able to tell me when you know this, why the angular resolution, the direction resolution is poor for 100 MeV and it is very good for 10 GeV. Simply because at 100 MeV, it cannot produce enough hits to reconstruct back the direction very well. At 1 GeV or 10 GeV, it has enough hits in the detector so that you can uh, to uh, get the angular direction very well. On the other hand, there is another problem. As you go higher in energy, the calorimeter is, uh, you have a limitation in the calorimeter. Hence, it cannot produce, the full shower cannot be contained inside the calorimeter. And hence, some part of the shower leaks out. That's why the energy resolution, even though the angular resolution is very, very good in case of a 10 GeV shower, the energy resolution is a little poorer. Whereas for again, 500 MeV uh, shower, it would be probably the both the angular resolution is good and the energy resolution is good. So there is a sweet spot where you want to analyze most of your data to get the best performance out of it. Okay. Then it, so it has a calorimeter, as I said, to measure the energy. And also it has an active shield because there are cosmic ray particles, which are also going and hitting the detector and producing various types of hits here. And so you need an anti-coincidence shield, something which would be not in coincidence with the detector. And you can then say that these are cosmic rays and throw them out from the system. So let me come to the next, at higher energies, what happens at higher gamma ray energies? You <clears throat> use something which are called imaging air, using a technique called the imaging air Cherenkov telescopes or imaging air Cherenkov technique. What happens is that let's say gamma ray shower, comes and hits the top of the Earth's atmosphere. It produces E plus and E minus, right? Because the dominant, uh, uh, the interaction of photons with matter, you know there are three processes and the most dominant for them would be the pair production for these type of photons because these are really multi TeV photons that we are talking about. <clears throat> now this E plus and E minus charged particle produces something which is called bremsstrahlung in the in the in the field of the in the when it interacts in the nucleus of the the air molecule so bremsstrahlung produces what does it produce another e plus or e minus and a photon the photon again produces e plus e minus and again a bremsstrahlung process so then a shower of particles start to happen so that is how i have shown here that the shower of particles happen and they happen till the time it cannot really do any more pair production so this is the region which is called the height of the shower maximum where the large number of charged particles have been produced. Now the, you can detect these charged particles if you could go up in the Earth's atmosphere and place detectors there. Let's say people do that at four kilometers, five kilometers above sea level. There are uh, detectors which are put in order to do cosmic ray physics. However, 
we are not we we are not so interested in doing the, just the charged particles. We want to understand from where the actual photon came from. <clears throat> so again, here we utilize the uh, the technique of exactly what the neutrino was doing in ice, the muon, the uh, producing a muon, and the muon was producing Cherenkov light. Here we employ the same thing: the charged particles, which are predominantly electrons and positrons, if they are moving with a speed greater than the velocity of uh, light in that medium, they would again produce Cherenkov light in air. And this Cherenkov in, light, in air is about one degree in, uh, if you calculate is very easy. Those who you know all from your master study that uh, cos theta is one over beta n uh, for Cherenkov light. Then it produces a pool of light on the ground at your observation level. And then if you produce, uh, put a telescope, these telescopes are nothing but just mirrors. So because it's optical light, the Cherenkov light comes in the blue, UV bluish region. So it's an optical light, the, but very, very fast optical light. So you put mirrors and then the mirror, so these are parallel rays coming and hitting your parabolic mirrors. So they would be going and focusing at your focus. And at the focus, you can put photomultipliers like this, clusters of photomultipliers like this. And from that, you can make images of the whole shower phenomena, the shower which has happened. <clears throat> and from that you can, and using those, you could uh, get the arrival direction energy and all that. So I'm not going spending too much time on that. That would be another talk some other day or later on if you ask me questions because I want to come to the uh, actual uh, physics one, which would be, which is far more interesting to look at. So now the current generation of ISCTs which are present in the world are actually, there are three. You forgot about Hess yes. in the Southern Hemisphere. So there is magic and veritas in the northern hemisphere, and there is S also in the southern hemisphere. And in India, we have also built one in the Himalayas, a telescope called MACE, a single imaging telescope called MACE, which has started to operate only in the last couple of years, and it's still undergoing commissioning phase on that. Yeah. MACE. Yeah. Oh, MACE. Yeah. MACE. This one is called MACE, M-A-C-E, Major Atmospheric Cherenkov Experiment. Yeah, we sometimes call it a mess. <laughs> I, I, I did not mention head because I assume that since you were not a poster, there is uh. not the important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, people would have killed me <laughs> on you <laughs> if they were. This is being recorded. This is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's to tell you a little bit about the magic telescopes, which operates between 50 GeV to 50 TeV around. This is the sweet energy range in which magic operates. It's located in the very beautiful islands in the Canary Islands, in one of the Canary Islands, which is called La Palma, and in one, the mountain top of La Palma, which is off the coast of Spain. Actually, the closest coast is Africa from there, but it, the island, group of islands belong to Spain. It's volcanic islands. And in fact, just two years ago, there was a volcanic eruption in La Palma, in the Canary Islands, for which we had to stop all operations for almost three to four months. The observatory had to be completely closed down for three to four months uh, because of the volcanic eruption. Liverpool telescope is in La Palma. So it hosts, uh, so these are, the, so this is the magic telescopes, the two telescopes of magic. So you can see these are basically mirrors which focus the Cherenkov light. And here at the focus, there are the photomultiplier. And here there are a bunch of uh, optical and infrared telescopes uh, which operate there. So it's the European uh, observatory kind of a place. <clears throat> so magic has about two times 17 meter telescopes in stereo mode. And uh, in these, in very high energy gamma ray astronomy, the sensitivity of a telescope is defined as at what percentage level of the Crab Nebula flux you can observe a source. Crab Nebula is, is accepted as a kind of a standard candle in VHG gamma ray astronomy that if I have observed the flux of Crab Nebula over the last 40, 50 years, it does not vary. It just varies within statistical errors, statistical and your systematic errors. In low energies, it's not that true because Fermi has seen variations in the flux of the Crab Nebula, at the MEV energies. But till now, in TEV energies, we have not seen any variation in the Crab Nebula. So we, design, we define it as a standard candle. And when we say that if I can see something which is at a certain percentage of the Crab Nebula, this is the weakest source that I would be able to observe with my telescope. That defines the sensitivity of my telescope. 
So magic can detect slightly less than 1% of the Crab Nebula flux for a source in about 50 hours, and the detection significance has to be greater than something called five sigma, okay? <clears throat> so in if you translate it into a layman's words, you can see TeV gamma rays from the Crab Nebula uh, in ma with, uh, magic in less than about two minutes. Why I uh, say this is that, let's say today is about, when I started doing my PhD 25 years ago, it took the telescopes which were there at that time, took about 10 to 15 hours to detect Crab Nebula flux. So, and then 10 years before, when the first imaging telescope was built by the Whipple telescope in 1989, and they detected the Crab Nebula, they took 50 hours to detect uh, flux from Crab Nebula. So you understand the importance of doing technological in innovations and doing experiments. Over 30 years, we have now gone from 50 hours of observation of one source to looking at a source in just about two minutes now. So when I started doing my PhD, we didn't think that we could complete our PhDs because there were only three or four sources in the sky at that time. We thought that we would never, that's why we spent all the time in instrumentation, trying to improve the sensitivity of our telescopes. We had no physics, really physics to do. We could not do much physics with it. But today you can, today with this, you have so many sources in the sky with Fermi and uh, Magic and Hess and Veritas. Today, it's a good time. You can do a lot of physics with it. <clears throat> I am reducing the noise level. So no, uh, the, the sensitivity depends on another, on another thing. What are the two levels of noise? If you ask me the thing, one is the night sky background. This is your noise because the Cherenkov light has to override over the night sky background and the man-made background over. over. That's one that you have to reduce. That you can do by building the hardware of the instrument ingeniously. But still, then there is an additional problem. Cherenkov light is produced not just by electromagnetic showers, but hadrons also would produce Cherenkov light. Hadrons, when they interact in the Earth's atmosphere, would also produce pions and muons and all these kind of things. And they would also produce Cherenkov light. So you have to distinguish between what is a Cherenkov light coming from a purely gamma ray shower and what is a Cherenkov light coming from a purely hadronic shower? Class distinction also requires a lot of analysis techniques to be developed and also a lot of hardware thing to be developed. So two things you have to do you, in improving the sensitivity. One is what you said, the noise level, the night sky background has to be killed. Smaller, it has to be made smaller and smaller. And then the identification of a particular event to be hadron-like or a gamma-like has to be done based on certain so parameters. The, the night sky Not the light sky level. You have to kill the night sky background in your hardware so that when you record, say, let's say I have a detector which would start to record. I should design the detector in such a way that it would not record night sky background, but record so mostly the, of light. Like, the, identifying that. I, exactly. Identify, I have to build my system in such a way that most of the night sky background should be killed and only the Cherenkov light should be captured. And there are ways to do that. Uh, there are very nice ways to do that. <clears throat> exactly. You, you take the advantage that Cherenkov light is coherent in nature. It follows Huygens construction principle. Night sky background is just random in nature. It does not follow any, in, any such uh, construction principle. So using that uh, methodology of Huygens construction, you can design your hardware such a way that you would uh, reject most of the night sky. Some amount of night sky background will be there, but you will reject most of it, but you will take in most of the cherry, identify most of the cherry of light. Once you have done that, then the next problem comes that you have to identify whether this is from a gamma ray shower or a hadron light shower. And this is where a lot of machine learning algorithms are being used these days. Machine learning algorithms are used in order to identify what is what based on various certain parameters of the, of the shower. So somebody who is interested in machine learning would find a lot of work here, actually. Okay, so now let's come to the flux. So remember I have told that spatial and temporal relation between cosmic rays, neutrinos, and gamma rays should give us ideas about the origin of cosmic rays. So what you need to do is to develop a program which is called, which we defined as the neutrino target of opportunity program. Just like in multi-wavelength, you have TOOs. Here I am having a TOO, but using neutrinos only. What would that program be? That if ice cube, 
would detect a neutrino above a certain threshold and it identifies that this is of astrophysical origin. It could be of astrophysical origin because neutrinos could be, uh, neutrinos can interact and produce atmospheric, uh, uh, cosmic rays can interact and produce atmospheric neutrinos. And those atmospheric neutrinos are not cosmogenic in nature. So I have to identify, classify again neutrinos that these are cosmogenic in nature. And then I give a trigger. I send an information to the gamma ray telescopes. Look, I have detected over a certain threshold neutrinos from this direction in sky. Can you point back to that source, uh, point back to that region and see? <clears throat> so this, I started, this was the time uh, in during my postdoc I did between 2007 and 2010 with the PIE Elisa Bernardini and other students and other postdocs in the group, we started to design and find out what would be the type of alert rates from background that would come, how will we implement this alert and all these kind of things we were doing at that time. Okay. So now a lot of time has passed since April 2016, IceCube collaboration began releasing real time alerts of detections of high energy neutrinos. <clears throat> so one could now start doing the search for neutrinos correlated with, let's say, gamma ray blazars, because if blazars are one of the most plausible sources of neutrinos and high energy gamma rays. So here is a kind of, I put a list, like what are the types of energies from which declination, which right ascension, what is the angular error with which ice cube can measure these uh, things? Because the ice cube detector has a poorer angular resolution than the gamma ray detector. So quite often you will see, you see the error is almost 10, 12 degrees. It's almost impossible to point to that region in the sky and locate because there would be hundreds of sources probably there. So you have to pick and choose which one you would want to uh, observe and which you have do not want to observe. So till 2017, there was no clear detection of a neutrino, wave, uh, neutrino with other wavelengths. <clears throat> now, let me again uh, say uh, which of the events can be TOs for the electromagnetic telescopes. So let's say IceCube has two types of detection uh, neutrinos which it can detect. One is a neutrino which would produce, which has an electron, which is an electron neutrino and produces a muon electron, uh, uh, muon, which would generate a shower inside. And that has a very, very large, they, these are called cascade events and has a large angular resolution. So these are almost of the order of 10 to 15 degrees. Another one is a muon which would be produced, which has long tracks. So since it has long tracks, you can reconstruct back the direction very well. And so these are called charge coupled interactions. If you know a little bit of particle physics, you would know what a neutral interactions and charge coupled interactions are. And these are called track events. So basically from the track, you can find out the direction and they have very good Angular resolution, very good means of the order of a degree or so. <clears throat> so, and these are the field of views of the electromagnetic telescopes, let's say. Hess and Magic and Veritas have uh, of the order of, these are of the order of three to five degrees. So there is no point in trying to follow up cascade events, which are 15 degrees angular resolution. You would never be able to know where to look at. Yeah. Only those which have less than one degree or less than one degree are the ones which you can go and try to observe. <clears throat> Okay, so now comes the real story. So as I said, on September 22nd, IceCube reported by uh, GCN that it has observed uh, a very high energy neutrino, which has a very good angular resolution of about 14 arc, 15 arc minutes. Okay, so this is about 0 .3, less than 0 0.3 degrees or so. Then on September 27th, Fermilat collaboration, Fermilat was following up this event. And then they found that uh, this blazer, which was within this error circle, TXS0506 was showing brightening in the GEV band. The spectrum was hard in nature. And uh, <clears throat> as soon as Fermilab detected this, they also kind of broadcasted it through an ETL and asked for triggering VHE, very high energy observations. And MAGIC started, tried to do the observations. And during that time, the weather was not always very favorable in La Palma. There was also moon in the sky. And you know that when there is moon, the Cherenkov light will completely die, uh, will drown inside the moonlight. So it was very difficult to do observations. So we had to wait for some time. And then on fourth, we did some little bit of observations on previous nights following this 27. Actually, following the ice cube alert, we had already started to observe this source. But then Fermilat gave us a second trigger, and then we started observing. And then at around on 4th of October, we detected a flavor a fl flare from this uh, from this blazer. So I'll show you now the uh, light curve and all of that. So this uh, created a flurry, and then 
other observatories were alerted, like the opticals and uh, SWIFT, uh, uh, X-ray telescopes, uh, SWIFT and New Star and others were all alerted, and they all started to see uh, flaring activity in all that. So, so a host of ATLs were generated in the next few days or in the weeks uh, to follow. <clears throat> Okay, so this is kind of now the pre first uh, light curve which we tried to produce. So the light curve, as you can see, in the initial part, it had no detection, and then slowly it started to detect the flare, and then there was the flare. And this was the ATL when Magic said that there is a flare, and then the flare kept on ri uh, rising. <clears throat> Hess also did uh, follow ups, very fast follow ups on few nights, uh, right? Up so this is the trigger. From when the ice cube trigger happened. This is the line where the ice cube trigger happened. And then magic started observing from there. But there was, then it could not observe for a few days, as I said, because there was moon uh, break uh, of the observatory because, because of presence of moon. And then the people started again observing. Veritas also observed with several hours of delay. In the initial stage, they did not detect anything. However, they detected later on, much uh, uh, later on. So now you may ask this question that, why did magic was the first to detect this kind of source, whereas Veritas or Hess could not detect? They were all imaging Cherenkov telescopes. Why couldn't they detect it? The primary reason is the, the redshift dependence of the source. The redshift of this source is, as I remember correctly, is around 0.4 or so. Now, at a redshift of 0.4, high energy photons would get uh, absorbed in the extragalactic background light, and then there would be a steepening in the spectrum. So, the energy at we, the energies which would pass through and be, be you would be able to observe are mostly the low energy gamma rays. So basically around 50 GeV or 60 GeV or 70 GeV. So you can actually calculate what would be the attenuation factor from your extragalactic background light calculations. Veritas and Hess all had a higher threshold during these observations. They were observing at 200 GeV or so threshold. Only magic has a very low energy threshold of around 50 GeV or so. That's one of the unique component of the magic telescope is that it has a very, very low energy threshold, the lowest currently uh, among the, these three telescopes. Yeah. That was the reason why we could detect uh, photons from these blazar, whereas Veritas and uh, Hess could not initially detect them. Veritas detected it later when the flare was still continuing they detected because they integrated over a long period of time and then they could detect, uh, uh, detect. So the threshold was around 90 GeV or so when we uh, detected it. <clears throat> okay, so then there were follow-up observations. As I said, that follow-up observations confirmed detection by many other telescopes. In fact, as I said, Veritas uh, had a certain trigger system, which we normally, they don't use always and they, use it only in certain cases, slightly lower energy threshold at around 110 GV, and later they also uh, detected. Hess also, I think, no, Hess, I think, did not detect uh, this source at that time. They detected it much later. And then they had, mostly Veritas had upper limits uh, of the source uh, since their threshold was somewhat higher in, in nature. So now if I compare the uh, Fermi, the long-term Fermi light curve with the long-term, let's say, magic light curve, this is when the ice cube alert had come. However, it's interesting to note that the Fermi light, light curve had already started rising before the neutrino alert came. <clears throat> How, we saw it after the neutrino alert. However, the Fermi light, light so that raises the important relation, uh, question is that, are these events going to be really related or not? It could be that they are completely unrelated in nature. Okay. I don't know how much time do I have? Uh, so five, minutes. five minutes, okay. I'll go fast over it. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we produced also the spectrum and there were not much clear spectral variability seen in both magic and veritas. It could be fitted with a simple power law and it was very, very soft. It has to be very soft because it is a source at very high redshift. <clears throat> there were, as I said, there are other telescopes, the optical ones and Swift X-rays, which were also an OVRO radio telescopes, which are, were also there, which were observing. Many of the, the X-ray telescopes also, X-ray telescopes were not observing it at that time. They had to be triggered. And later on, they also showed uh, flux variability in X-rays and also a little bit of flux variability in uh, optical, but not much variability in optical. 
<clears throat> so these are the observations you can go and read up a bit in these uh, uh, papers. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, ice cube Fermi and uh, magic events, we made the spatial plot of where the exactly the events are coming from. And we can show that within the error circle of ice cube Fermi lat and magic, this is the TXS within the confidence of with confidence of 90% confidence. We can say that this is a fluctuation which is disfavored at around three sigma. So you have to understand one thing in neutrino astronomy, since you're detecting one of the first sources, you, you have to ask the question, what is the chance probability that just by chance this coincidence happened? And this was disfavored at three greater than three sigma. Uh, one could calculate the energy of the neutrino, which was about 300 TeV. Uh, an upper limit of about 4.5 PV, which depends on the assumed spectrum of neutrino, neutrino spectrum that you use. And from that, uh, you can now see multiply it by 20 times and you get the, the rough energy of the cosmic rays that was detected. People produce the SEDs. So uh, almost a large number of people who were ready with their models started fitting the data. So you can see almost like eight or 10 papers came out within a couple of months or so, as I say, explosion of theoretical papers in the archive in the next days. Magic also did, has his own um, uh, people who do modeling and uh, they did the model <clears throat> and found out that the maximum proton energy could be as high as 10 to the power of uh, 16 electron volt or so. Uh, there are various alternative scenarios. People had even fitted with the concept that there are no neutrinos. So the neutrino doesn't is not related with the anything with the Fermilat or the magic observations. You can actually get uh, a good, uh, reasonably good fit even without having any neutrinos, just with a leptonic scenario. <clears throat> but the fact that there are hadron, the, the fact that you have detected neutrinos told, tells you that there is hadronic acceleration mechanism at play. Only that they may not be time temporally correlated. There is spatial correlation for sure, but there, is, there may or may not be any temporal correlation. With just one neutrino, you cannot do this. It's almost impossible. We had also done some work in the last couple of years uh, with uh, Ritanjali and Shunanda from IIT Jodhpur on this TXS where we uh, showed that we, using proton synchrotron model, one could also explain the uh, SED quite well. <clears throat> Something more interesting came out from IceCube is that then the IceCube went back and tried to search their archival data. Has there been any flare of neutrinos which could not have been could have been seen, which they had missed earlier? And indeed, by using better algorithms or machine learning algorithms, they found out that in 2014-15, there was a flux of neutrinos detected from TXS 0506 at the level of 3.5 sigma when Fermilat was at a low state. So that was very, very intriguing. So if you compare the Fermilat flux during the ice cube uh, excess, you would see that the Fermilat flux is very, very low. So that raised the mainly the question, is it really related or not related or so? And there was, as I said, no significant change in spectral shape in Fermilat then and now again. Yeah. So, uh, so the, this is kind of the crux of the summary uh, of now with other, what is going on uh, with other other events, IceCube keeps on generating more and more neutrino events now as it improves its uh, sensitivity. And there were some more, uh, one more sent around with the Blazer PKS 1502.10.6, but uh, however, which was at a very high redshift of 1.84. So there was no chance any VH gamma ray telescope could observe this. And so there are a few others which have been sent around in the last two or three years none of them have resulted in any significant detections in any other wavelengths. More recent news that IceCube has also in their nine year search has yielded two more sources, NGC 1068 being the most significant apart from TXS and at a slightly lower significance, another blazer, which is PKS 1424, which is an HBL again, detected by Veritas in 2009. And here is the IceCube kind of the excess events that you see over the uh, background. But, yeah, yeah, it's a CIFR 2 galaxy. It's a completely different type class of source. So they have identified a completely different class of source apart from the blazers, which can accelerate, but which are plausible sources of uh, neutrinos. Absolutely. However, NGC 1068 magic has observed for many, many hours, not during the ice cube time, but earlier, but it has not, it has been detected by Fermilat 
but it has not been detected by magic. So that even raises another very important question about the connection between VHE and uh, neutrino and the particle acceleration. So as I said, that there were non-simultaneous uh, non multi-frequency observations that you see Fermilab has detected, uh, but magic had upper limits from it. And, but the neutrino, uh, in fact, according to IceCube, during their observation, it should have been detected. But unfortunately, uh, the TEV telescopes uh, did not uh, detect it. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me end in the last just two minutes to take what's there in the uh, future. So now we are at now at a threshold kind of with these few detections that we can go over from just detection to doing astronomy in later. What, what it requires to do astronomy then that you need many, many more sources in order to do astronomy really. So for that, there is a multi-kilometer cube neutrino telescope being built in the Mediterranean. The first prototypes have been deployed already in 2017. They are still deploying many, many more strings. It will be so ice cube is a one kilometer cube detector. So this would be of the order of close to 10 kilometer cube detector. So 10 times better, or at least not 10 times, but at least somewhat better sensitivity we would be uh, expecting. Then in the uh, very high energy gamma ray, uh, also I, ice cube itself is going to expand into something called the ice cube generation two, gen two, which is an extension of the ice cube. And the deployment has not yet started. The strings will be deployed by early 2025. And India is considering to join this deployment through TIFR at this moment. And uh, then <clears throat> uh, gamma ray telescopes are also expanding. They are trying to build a real observatory called the Cherenkov Telescope Array, where there would be a host of telescopes, both in the Northern and Southern hemisphere, so that you can follow up all these events. The, this is kind of the sensitivity. So, what we are aiming at that you, you see most of the telescopes that operate now are at 1% level of crab. Now we are trying to improve that to even 10 times better. So 0.1% of the crab nebula flux that we would like to go to in order to see many more sources and have uh, many detections. So I was also involved in building one of these telescopes. So in <clears throat> SINP uh, with TIFR and SINP, we together build the calibration system for the calibration of these photomultipliers. So how you would like to calibrate the photomultipliers. Uh, that's a simple system we also built in uh, SINP in the last few years. And now we are waiting for funding, more funding if we can really join and join CTA and do our work. So let me conclude now. At least we have been able to establish that blazards are plausible sources of very high energy cosmic rays beyond tens of PV, several tens of PV, from 10 to the power of 15 to 10 to the power of 17 electron volt. We have been only been able to see them during flares as of yet. So our sensitivity is still not high enough to see them in all sorts of states. Mostly during flares, we see them. But they are definitely not accelerating particles as of yet to ultra high energy cosmic rays, so up to 10 to the power of 20 or 21 electron volts. So detection of a blazer in flaring state in gamma rays in connection with a high energy neutrino, as I said, it has raised many more questions than it has really answered. Is there really a temporal? We have established spatial correlation, but is there really a temporal correlation or not? <clears throat> and then th there are other uh, things which uh, I... Uh, so the thing is that when a 300 TeV neutrino, uh, in conjunction, the photons that you would see, the gamma ray photons that you'd see, the theoretical predictions, it also said that all these photons would have been absorbed. Most of them should have been abs uh, absorbed in the extragalactic background light for a source at a redshift of 0.4, around 0.4. So in principle, we should not have observed these uh, photons. The fact that we observe these photons, even though with a very steep spectrum, raises also the question whether we know the extragalactic background light at these redshifts that well or not, whether they can be reduced or not. There is also a question for cosmologists to deal with and people who work with extragalactic background light to deal with. But at least we have first time a multi-messenger SED to available for interpretation. And as I said, that we need many more such events. In the last years, we have been performing regular electromagnetic follow-ups of high energy neutrino events. We need very tight cooperation between these observatories. And I hope that the future is bright with the next generation of telescopes and detectors to come. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> yes. huh. Oh, I think he's just laughing. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Uh, a very nice job, sir. So uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, can you please uh, elaborate on uh, uh, on the fact that uh, how do we uh, how, how do we get to know uh, if if the neutrino is coming from the atmosphere or it has a ah, cosmic okay. source? So I do not I do not think I have a slide on it, but I'll try to answer it uh, uh, in a certain way. So. The neutrinos which pass all the way through your earth and hit your detector are the ones which are the most has the most highest energies. And they are the ones which are not going to be getting in your uh, produced in the atmosphere. So the atmosphere, the neutrino that produce are produced in cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere have an energy which stops prime. It follows a much steeper spectrum. It has a spectrum of three to the 3.7 e to the power of minus 3.7, and they basically stop around 100 TeV or so. That is why, most importantly, you see that I, I was hinting at the PeV neutrino astronomy. Only you can do start to do this type of, identify these neutrinos as cosmogenic because you are going to much higher energies to, uh, to what the atmospheric neutrinos would be. So that's one, that's the one way to uh, do that. In order to say whether TV neutrinos are present or not, you need to do many more analysis and algorithms building to do that. Just from physics considerations, you would not be able to say directly that. Okay. You said one more question you had. So uh, apart from uh, having a lower threshold uh, for a magic, what is the difference, fundamental differences between these the, uh, okay. So basically, I want to know these three telescopes. These three telescopes, telescopes. Uh, which are detecting neutrons. So basically, my question is why do we need the more and more uh, like multiple uh, neutrino detectors? Uh, okay. the these are gamma ray detectors. Sorry. These are why do you need multiple? Okay, okay. So the idea was so the idea where there were two things. One, the field of view of magic. If I go back and you will see this one. Yeah, that's one thing, but I'll tell you also one more interesting thing. You see here, the field of view of Hess is 5 degrees, whereas the field of view of Veritas or Magic is 3.5 degrees. So they have a smaller field of view. Magic, by going for lower energies, was specifically intended to build to study point sources more. Whereas Hess, Going to the southern hemisphere, that was the motivation of Hess going to the southern hemisphere, because in the southern hemisphere, you see the galactic plane very well. You would identify supernova remnants and other these type of pulsars and pulsar wind nebula, which are more extended objects. And for that, you need a larger field of view. So that, that is the reason people actually magic and Hess comes from their same predecessor experiment called Higra, which ran in the 1990s. Then they kind of bifurcated in two directions. They wanted to build two different types of telescopes. One said that I want to reduce my threshold. And so I would need a larger telescope, which is 17 meter. Whereas Hess said that, no, I want a larger field of view, not a large uh, collecting area, but a larger field of view because I want to study extended sources. And they went to the south to study galactic sources. So Hess has a smaller number of telescopes. So it has four telescopes, but 12 meter telescopes. So the physics considerations were slightly different in which they did that. Mace. No, Hess did not see simply because you know they were from the they were in the southern hemisphere. So to locate something in the northern hemisphere, they are at a higher zenith angle. Once you go to a higher zenith angle, your threshold also rises. The because the photons, the showers which are produced at higher zenith angle travels through a bigger mass. So the threshold is higher. That's why they could not detect it, actually. Yes. 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 So thank you for the talk, sir. Uh, my question is actually when you shared it to what Ohanadati just asked, that uh, uh, you classified the neutrinos which are from the atmospheric sources or which are from the cosmic sources. Now, uh, in the cosmic sources, there are many other sources apart from the one which we are uh, focusing on. So how do you differentiate between those? Like uh, there could be neutrinos from sun or any other sources. So how do you differentiate between No, because these are sources which you know in your error circle which sources are there. Sun is somewhere else. I think that 
it's it's a telescope it sure. even though it's a static detector it's a static detector the sky passes over it so you can detect neutrinos coming from you can bin your sky in different zenith angles and within that bin you can try to detect how many neutrinos have come from this bin and you and you see if within your angular resolution there are sources or not and you measure the excess above the background. Here, the background is the atmospheric neutrinos or other cosmic ray background, which are there, other muon uh, background, which is there, above which you see a signal. But you have the signal within an error region of about one degree or so. And within one degree, you see what is the most plausible. Then you do a spatial correlation. So there also, there is a special limit on the uh, beyond which we uh, do the ones, which is from the uh, directed source or from the other cosmic sources. I mean, uh, is there some sort of a limit uh, like the, we just eliminate the cos other cosmic source neutrinos uh, within that limit and uh, specify some- You are trying to say whether there would be, what is the probability that a neutrino will come within my field of view from a different source than what exactly. my yeah. where my yeah. source is. You have to take that into account. That's why you do have to do a calculation. That's, that's what you call the trial uh, calculation. Okay. So, so this picture would kind of tell you a bit about that. Uh, I couldn't, uh, because of lack of time, I did not spend uh, here. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh oh. oh. Uh, uh, so what they do is that these are all types of neutrino events coming from every region in the sky. And you are trying to find whether there is an excess of neutrinos from a certain position in the sky. Achha, achha. Okay, that, that's what you are trying, exactly, trying to exactly. do. Okay. Yeah. And then you define that within my error circle, what sources are present there. Okay. Yeah. And also, okay, yeah, that's also true. Yeah, yes, good point. Good point. Yeah. So, sir, thank you for your nice talk. So, I have a very basic question. So, in your last slide, you, you used the term flare. So, what is it? Ah, what is a flare? Okay. So, <clears throat> let us say I am trying to measure the light coming from this lamp there up there. And I try to measure it over time. Today I measure, tomorrow I measure. Uh, for 100 years, I keep measuring it. Okay. And then I try to find out, is there a variation in the flux of that photons coming from that? If I start to see some variations from that, I would now need to quantify at what level I have seen these variations. Is it as a three sigma level? Is it at one sigma level? Is it? So I can put a certain threshold of this, the, of this on this variation. And then the, I can say, let's say I say that if the flux goes two times the average flux that I have measured over my 10 years of observation, I would call this a flare. So this is kind of a definition. It, it slightly changes from definition to definition in some certain sense. In, you can call something a flare in VHE gamma rays, which is not maybe a flare in neutrinos also. So it, it depends upon what threshold, what is your baseline and all that is, is there. But basically it's measuring the variations in the light curve. That Thank you. My second question is that you mentioned uh, in the case of ice cube detector, so there are also charged particle coming, uh, the neutron is also coming, and you said that, okay, so I have used a, uh, I mean, a shield to distinguish the charged particle. Okay. Not in case of ice cube. The reason why you build ice cube below the ice is basically how many charged particles do you think will go below Earth surface and uh, produce, uh, yeah. Remember your DE, DX curve of charged particles in nuclear physics or you have studied. So this is the natural shield. Yeah, this is the natural shield. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Fermilat, you need to build a shield because you are in space, there are charged particles. So you need to build an anti-coincidence shield in order to uh, eliminate the charged particles. Ah, for Fermi, I think you are referring to Fermi, this one when I said this. For Fermi, you need to build an anti-coincidence shield. So what you say is that I, I, so what is a coincidence circuit? It's like, let's say if I have two detectors, let's say I have two, this one as a detector and I have another one side my detector. 
I have an event which hits this detector and also produces a signal in this detector. The same event produces. This, if I put in a coincidence, so in electronic terms, it is one, one, the output is one. If it is one, zero, output is zero. If it is zero, one, output is zero. That's a coincidence circuit. The anti-coincidence circuit is just the opposite of it. That's all you need to build to shield. Okay. I have a very nice question. Um, so you said you uh, one of the measures of significance you use is the magnification. And so I my question is, does it make sense to also uh, construct prior ratios based on the rates of these events? You mean prior list of sources? Yes. And yes, Ice Cube does that also. So why is that with the like you to get something yeah. like this? Exactly. So, so le le let me explain what a little bit more in detail what Ice Cube, even though I'm not an, anymore in Ice Cube collaboration, so I may not be saying everything very correctly or not, but at least the ideas I can try to give you is that one thing you have 